Video gaming technology has seen a lot of innovation in the short time it's been available to us. In this video, we'll examine this fascinating subject from its humble beginnings and trace its rise to a dominant form of home entertainment. The market for home video game consoles has frequently been split into generations in the video game business. There have been nine distinct home console generations since the first ones were released in 1972. The first generation of home consoles were mostly dedicated consoles with only one or two games pre-installed on the hardware and minimal options for changing gameplay settings. While the Odyssey did come with game cards, these didn't contain any pre-programmed games and instead served as jumpers to change the existing circuitry pathway, not extending the console's capabilities. Unlike most subsequent console generations, the first generation was created in limited quantities rather than as a continuous product line. The first home console was the Magnavox Odyssey in September 1972 based on Bayer's brown box design. Magnavox shifted from solid state circuits to affordable integrated circuit chips and developed a new range of consoles in the Odyssey series from 1975 to 1977. At the same time, Atari had successfully debuted Pong as an arcade game in 1972, and in late 1974, they began work on a home console version, which they finally collaborated with Sears to release by the 1975 Christmas season. In comparison to the Odyssey, Pong has various technological benefits, including an inbuilt sound chip and the ability to keep score. Bayer, who was having trouble convincing Magnavox management to market the console, alerted Coleco's Arnold Greenberg about a new low-cost chip suited for home consoles, prompting Coleco to construct the first Telsar console in 1976. With Magnavox, Atari, and Coleco all contending for the console space in 1976, and significant cost reductions in crucial processing chips from General Instruments, other third-party manufacturers entered the console market by 1977, most of which were low-quality clones of Pong or other games. By 1977, the market had reached saturation, with hundreds of consoles on the market, and the industry had seen its first market meltdown. At this moment, the Japanese gaming console market followed a similar trend. By 1971, Nintendo had already partnered with Magnavox and assisted in the development of the console's early light guns. In 1975, Epoch Co. introduced the TV Tennis Electro Tennis, a dedicated home game device developed in collaboration with Magnavox. As in the United States, clones of these dedicated consoles began to appear, the majority of which were built by significant television manufacturers such as Toshiba and Sharp, and these games were dubbed TV Gimu or Teribi Gimu, TV games in Japan. Meanwhile, the first personal computer was released in the early 1980s, and with it came the springboard effect that catapulted gaming into the global spotlight. Byte called this game system a quote-unquote great gaming device because of its unprecedented speed and sophistication. While it wasn't ideal, it was a step in the right direction, allowing ordinary people to play games from the comfort of their own homes, without taking up their entire bedroom. Microsoft Adventure and Microsoft Flight Simulator were two early titles that were still quite basic in design and function. A year later, HP produced the HP 9000 technical computer, the first mainframe desktop computer. It had the same processing capability as the room-shaped computers from the 1960s, but was a fraction of the size, bringing us one step closer to modern-day gaming as we know it. Other noteworthy arrivals in the 80s, including MS-DOS, Microsoft's disk operating system, the creation of Dell, the first-ever VGA video card, providing consumers with 640x480 resolution and outmatched the competing Omega console when it came to graphics. By the late 1980s, the PC market was exploding, 
with DOS systems outnumbering the less spectacular Commodore and Apple competitors in homes. Dell's market capitalization has increased from $1,000 to $85 million just four years after it was founded. Computer gear had arrived on the residential scene. The second generation of home consoles was distinguished by the introduction of the game cartridge, where the game's code is stored in read-only memory (ROM) within the cartridge. The electrical connections allow the main console's processors to read the game's code from the ROM when the cartridge is inserted into the console. While ROM cartridges have previously been utilized in other computer applications, the ROM game cartridge was originally introduced in November 1976 with the Fairchild Video Entertainment System. The Atari 2600, known as the Atari Video Computer System at launch, the Magnavox Odyssey 2, Mattel Electronics and Television, and the ColecoVision were all cartridge-based consoles during this generation. Newer CPU technology allowed games to feature up to eight colors and three channel audio effects in addition to consoles. The arrival of cartridge-based systems necessitated the creation of a diverse set of games for them. Atari was one of the first companies to hit the scene. They marketed the platform in numerous countries, including Japan, and held complete control over the game production process. The golden age of arcade video games, which began in 1978 to 1979 with the debut of Space Invaders and Asteroids, coincided with game development and copies of these arcade games were excellent targets. The 1980 introduction of the Atari 2600 version of Space Invaders was hailed as the quote-unquote killer app for home video game systems, helping double the console's sales. Atari was acquired by Warner Communications at the same time, and internal rules led to the departure of four important programmers, David Crane, Larry Kaplan, Alan Miller, and Bob Whitehead, who established Activision. Activision went on to create games for the Atari 2600, as well as other platforms. They tried legal action to stop the practice, but the case was settled out of court, with Activision agreeing to pay royalties in exchange for the right to continue developing games, making Activision the first third-party game creator. Activision rapidly became a hit with games like Pitfall, generating $50 million in revenue in 18 months on a budget of less than $1 million. Following Activision's breakthrough, a slew of other businesses stepped into game production, in an attempt to cash in on a quickly increasing North American video game market. By the early 1980s, this had resulted in a loss of publishing control and a dilution of the gaming market. Atari and the other firms have also remained interested in licensed video game potential following the triumph of Space Invaders. In 1982, Atari placed a large bet on the now infamous commercial sale of E.T., but it was rushed to market and received poorly, failing to meet Atari's sales projections. In 1983, the North American home console market crashed due to competition from low-cost home computers. For the most part, the 1983 collapse marked the end of this generation, with Nintendo's release of the Famicom the following year ushering in the third. When Nintendo released the Famicom in North America under the name Nintendo Entertainment System, it helped revitalize the industry. And Atari, now owned by Jack Tramiel, pushed sales of the previously successful Atari 600 under new branding to keep the company afloat for many more years while he transitioned the company toward the personal computer market. The Atari 2600 was manufactured until 1992, marking the end of the second generation of video games. The third generation of consoles, dubbed the 8-bit generation, employed 8-bit CPUs that allowed for up to 5 bits of color 25 or 32 colors, 5 audio channels, and more complex graphic capabilities, such as sprites and tiles, rather than the block-based graphics of the second generation. 
As a result of the 1983 catastrophe, market supremacy shifted from the United States to Japan for the third console. In Japan, the Sega SG-1000 and the Nintendo Famicom were released almost simultaneously in 1983. After some early technical issues, the Famicom quickly gained traction, and by the end of 1984 had become Japan's best-selling console. Nintendo wanted to introduce the console to North America at that moment, but they were aware of the flaws produced by the video game crash. To avoid the video game label baggage, Nintendo took significant efforts to remodel the console and rename it as the Nintendo Entertainment System, the NES, for North America. To avoid the loss of publishing control that occurred following the Famicom's release in both North America and Asia, Nintendo implemented a lockout mechanism that required all game cartridges developed by Nintendo to have a specific chip. The system would not be able to play the game if this chip was missing. This also provided Nintendo complete control over the games released on the system, allowing it to reject any that it deemed to be too mature. In 1985, the NES was released in North America, and it helped to reinvigorate the game industry. Sega attempted to compete with the NES with its own master system, which was introduced in both the US and Japan later in 1985, but failed to gain traction. Similarly, Atari's attempt to compete with the NES in 1987 with the Atari 7800 failed to dethrone the NES. The NES was produced until 2003 when it, along with its successor, the Super Nintendo Entertainment System, was discontinued. The fourth generation console, commonly known as the 16-bit generation, upgraded core console technology with 16-bit processors, enhancing game graphics and audio capabilities. Despite having an 8-bit CPU, NEC's TurboGrafx-16, or PC Engine as it's known in Japan, was considered the first fourth-generation console when it was released in 1987. The console's 16-bit graphics engine offered its capabilities comparable to the other fourth-generation consoles, and the NEC's marketing positioned it as a 16-bit upgrade over the NES. The 1988 Sega Genesis, or the Mega Drive in Japan, and the 1990 Super Nintendo Entertainment System were both real 16-bit platforms when they reached the fourth generation, SNES or the Super Famicom in Japan. SNK also entered the competition with a modified Neo Geo MVS arcade system, which was released in 1990 and tried to bridge the gap between arcade and home console systems by sharing game cartridges and memory cards. The so-called console wars between Nintendo and Sega dominated this generation, especially in North America. To counter Nintendo's dominance, Sega invented Sonic the Hedgehog, a mascot figure with a cool demeanor that appealed to Western youth in contrast to Nintendo's Mario, and coupled the Genesis with the game of the same name. Sega became the dominant player in North America until the mid-1990s because of this strategy. During this generation, the technology costs of employing optical discs in the form of CD-ROMs have decreased to the point where they are now desirable for shipping computer software, including video games, for personal computers. CD-ROMs have more storage space than game cartridges and could be utilized in games to play full motion video and other detailed audiovisual works. Console makers responded by developing hardware add-ons that could read and play CD-ROMs, such as NEC's TurboGrafx CD add-on, together with the integrated Turbo Duo system, Sega's Genesis CD add-on in 1991, and the Neo Geo CD in 1994. The cost of these add-ons was often considerable, approaching the cost of the system itself and they were phased out with the introduction of disc-based consoles in the fifth generation, beginning in 1993. Nintendo had originally partnered with Sony to create the Super NES CD-ROM, a similar add-on for the SNES, but their economic connection had broken down shortly before its release. 
and Sony would go on to produce the fifth generation PlayStation. Philips also tried to get into the market with the CDI, a specialized CD-ROM format released in 1990 that offered additional uses for CD-ROM media aside from video games, but the console was never successful. The SNES's demise in 2003 marked the end of the fourth generation, which had a long tail that overlapped with the fifth generation. To keep up with the new fifth generation consoles, Nintendo began incorporating co-processors into game cartridges to boost the SNES's capabilities. The Super FX chip was initially utilized in the game Star Fox in 1993, which is widely regarded as one of the first console games to feature real-time polygon-based 3D rendering. In both the hardware and game industries, the 1990s saw a slew of interesting newcomers. In slightly over a year, after its release in 1992, Wolfenstein 3D sold over 200,000 copies. While it is credited with inventing the first-person shooter genre, it was quickly eclipsed by Doom, which came out only a year later. Doom was soon hailed as the most significant game in the development of the first-person shooter genre after its release. While the graphics of Wolfenstein and Doom are far below today's standards, they were considered tremendous technological leaps ahead of their time, especially when compared to games from the early 1970s. DOS dominated the gaming market between 1991 and 1995, accounting for 91 to 94 percent of all computer game sales during that period. The 486 PC CPU, which was significantly quicker than the competing consoles at the time, was a big reason for its appeal. Valve releases its first game, Half-Life, as the decade draws to a close. The game was an instant hit with gamers, quickly becoming one of the most popular first-person shooter games ever released. It was so popular that it spawned multiple fan-made versions, including a competitive combat shooter that would make Valve a household name. Unreal is finally launched before the end of the decade, generating the Unreal Engine and a new manner of game design. While it was still the early days, this would eventually become the blueprint for more realism in the next generation of gaming. During this time, personal computers became more popular as a platform for playing video games. Despite this, the video game console industry thrived alongside home computers, thanks to the benefits of much lower prices, easier portability, circuitry dedicated specifically to video games, the ability to be played on a television set, which PCs of the time couldn't do in most cases, and intensive first-party software support from the manufacturers, who were essentially betting their entire future on their consoles. Apart from the switch to 32-bit processors, most firms, with the exception of Nintendo, shifted to dedicated optical media formats instead of game cartridges with the fifth generation of consoles, due to their lower production costs and increased storage capacity. In 1993, the Amiga, CD32, 3DO, and Atari Jaguar were among the first fifth generation consoles attempting to capitalize on the potential power of CD-ROMs. However, these systems were far more expensive early in the cycle than previous fourth generation models and had much smaller game libraries. Furthermore, Nintendo's usage of coprocessors in the late SNES titles ensured that the Super Nintendo remained one of the best selling console systems despite the introduction of new fifth generation consoles. In 1995, two of the most important fifth generation systems were released the Sega Saturn, and the Sony PlayStation, both of which challenged the Super Nintendo's continued supremacy. While the Saturn sold successfully, it had a lot of technological faults, but it positioned Sega as a home of a number of important gaming franchises in the future. In addition to optical media, the PlayStation enabled the use of memory cards to save the state of a game. Though the Neo Geo employed memory cards to transfer game information, between home and arcade systems, the PlayStation's approach allowed for far lengthier gameplay and narrative features, resulting in very successful role-playing titles such as Final Fantasy VII. By 1996, 
the PlayStation had surpassed the SNES as the most popular console. Nintendo's next console, the Nintendo 64, was introduced in late 1996. Unlike other fifth generation consoles, it continued to employ game cartridges because Nintendo considered the load time advantages of cartridges over CD-ROMs to still be very important, as was their ability to apply copyright lockout methods. Nintendo built a large library of first party titles for the game, including Super Mario 64 and The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time, which helped to propel sales. While sales of the console itself did not match those of the PlayStation, it kept Nintendo in the home console market alongside Sony and Sega. The fifth generation has a long overlap with the sixth console generation, similar to the transition from the fourth to the fifth generation, with the PlayStation being in production until 2005. Gaming graphics and hardware were increasing at an exponential rate by the early 2000s. Most American households had PCs, and gaming was becoming increasingly popular around the world. Counter-Strike is published by Valve at the end of 2000, and it immediately becomes one of the most popular competitive first-person shooters of all time. It goes on to sell more than 25 million copies around the world, igniting a competitive gaming industry that would develop over the next 15 years. Valve provided the Steam platform to the gaming community only a few years after the debut of Counter-Strike. It immediately became one of the most popular gaming platforms, with thousands of titles available to its devoted fans. Alongside the first-person shooter Grandeur, the 2000s also gave us World of Warcraft, one of the best MMORPGs ever developed. In 2004, the game was introduced, and it immediately rose through the global subscription rankings. World of Warcraft had over 12 million subscribers by the end of the decade, making it the most popular MMORPG of all time. Faster graphics accelerators and improving CPU technologies have resulted in far higher degrees of realism in computer games by this point. High-performance graphics cards like Nvidia and Radeon allow game creators to improve the complexity of modern game engines. By the sixth generation, console technology began to catch up to the performance of personal computers of the time, and the use of bits as their selling point fell by the wayside. Instead, console manufacturers focused their marketing efforts on the specific qualities of their game libraries. The sixth generation of consoles saw a broader acceptance of optical media, with support of the DVD format for even more data storage capacity, alternative internal storage options that could be used as memory cards, and support for connecting to the internet either directly or through add-ons. Consoles began to move away from single-feature systems and towards a convergence of functions from other electronic living room gadgets. Sega, Sony, and Nintendo were the only major participants in the market at this time. The Dreamcast, which was first released in Japan in 1998, gave Sega an early lead. It was the first home console to incorporate a modem for connecting to the Sega network and playing online games. However, Sega discovered various technical faults that needed to be addressed before the game's release in the United States in 1999. Despite being more popular in the West than in Japan, the console was quickly outperformed by Sony's PlayStation 2 in 2000. The PS2 was the first console to enable DVD playing in addition to CD-ROM playback, as well as keeping backward compatibility with titles from the PlayStation catalog, which helped to attract PlayStation long-tail customers. While rival 6th generation systems did not anticipate this step, the PlayStation 2's backwards compatibility became a prominent design concern for future generations. The PlayStation 2 sold 155 million units until being discontinued in 2013, and it was still the best-selling home console of all time as of 2020. Unable to compete with Sony, Sega discontinued the Dreamcast in 2001, and left the hardware market entirely, instead focusing on its software properties. 
Nintendo's GameCube, released in 2001, was the company's first system to utilize optical discs based on the mini-DVD format. The GameCube could also play Game Boy cartridges with a special Game Boy Player attachment, and adapters were available to connect the console to the internet via broadband or modem. Microsoft also entered the console market at this time, with the release of its first Xbox system in 2001. The popularity of the PlayStation 2 was seen by Microsoft as a danger to the personal computer in the living room, thus the Xbox was created to compete. As a result, the Xbox was constructed using Microsoft's personal computer experience with an operating system based on Microsoft Windows and DirectX capabilities, a hard disk for game saves, built-in Ethernet functionality, and the first console online service, Xbox Live, to support multiplayer games. By the seventh generation, Sony, Microsoft, and Nintendo had all developed consoles that could connect to the internet, with networking support for both wired and wireless connections, online services to support multiplayer games, digital storefronts for digital game purchases, and both internal and external storage support for these games on the console. The consoles also added support for digital television resolutions via HDMI interfaces, but a standard for high-definition playback had yet to be established due to the high-definition optical disc format battle between Blu-ray and HD DVD at the time. Another innovation was the use of motion controllers, which were either incorporated into the console or sold separately. By the mid-2000s, video game consoles had become an integral element of the global IT infrastructure. In 2007, it was estimated that video game consoles accounted for 25% of the world's general purpose computer power. In 2005, Microsoft was the first to enter the seventh generation with the Xbox 360. Over the course of its life, the Xbox 360 underwent multiple hardware updates, which became a common procedure for Microsoft in the future. These versions offered additional capabilities, such as a larger internal hard drive, or a faster processor at a higher price point. The Xbox 360 supported DVD discs out of the box, while Microsoft chose to support the HD DVD format via an add-on for movie playback. However, in comparison to Blu-ray, this format has become obsolete. About half of the original Xbox library was backwards compatible with the Xbox 360. It was plagued by a hardware flaw known as the Red Ring of Death, and Microsoft spent over $1 billion attempting to fix it. In 2006, Sony released the PlayStation 3. It marked the transition from Sony's proprietary Emotion engine to a more conventional x86-based architecture. The PS3 originally came with a special Emotion Engine daughter board that allowed for backwards compatibility with PlayStation 2 games, but later iterations of the console removed it, leaving only software-based emulation for PlayStation titles. Sony bet on the Blu-ray format, which was built in from the beginning. Sony debuted the PlayStation Network for its online services and retail with the PlayStation 3. The Wii was released in 2006, at the same time as the PlayStation 3. Because Nintendo lacked the same manufacturing capabilities and relationships with major hardware suppliers as Sony and Microsoft, the Wii was instead designed around the revolutionary usage of motion controls in the Wii Remote rather than a feature-for-feature -feature strategy. The Blue Ocean strategy, or releasing a product with no competition, was credited with the unit's success, and prompted Microsoft and Sony to build their own motion control accessors in order to compete. Nintendo supplied a number of online services to which the Wii could connect, including the Virtual Console, which allowed gamers to purchase both emulated games from previous Nintendo consoles as well as Wii games. The Wii used standard DVDs as its gaming medium, although it also supported GameCube discs natively. The Wii was widely regarded as a surprising hit that many developers had neglected at first. Following the popularity of the Wii Remote, 
Microsoft and Sony launched motion detecting controllers for their respective platforms. Microsoft introduced the Kinect motion controller device for the Xbox 360, which served as a camera, microphone, and motion sensor for numerous games. Sony released the PlayStation Move, a system consisting of a camera and lit handheld controllers, which worked with its PlayStation 3. The seventh generation concluded with the discontinuation of the PlayStation 3 in 2017. Gaming became one of the world's largest industries after the 2000s, evolving year by year. AMD and Intel are now always competing to better each other, and the graphics sector is witnessing a similar narrative between Radeon and Nvidia. Gaming has now progressed to new degrees of realism, approaching what we know by today's standards. After 11 years of work, Unreal Engine 4 is eventually released instantly establishing itself as the peak of 3D graphics capabilities. Despite being intended for first-person shooters, the engine has been successfully adapted into a variety of different game genres, including fighting games, MMORPGs, and role-playing games. Gfinity opened the first specialized esports arena in the UK in 2015, responding to a rise in competitive gaming. The arena holds a variety of events throughout the year, attracting over 58 million viewers and covering a variety of esports. Nintendo considered the Wii U, which was released in 2012, to be a Wii successor geared towards more serious players. The Wii U GamePad, a tablet-slash-controller combination that served as a second screen, provided backward compatibility with the Wii, including its motion controls. Nintendo improved upon their network offerings by creating the Nintendo Network Service, which combines in-store and internet connectivity. The Wii U did not do as well as Nintendo had hoped, since many users mistook the gamepad for a tablet they could take away from the console, and the console itself struggled to attract third-party developers as the Wii did. The PlayStation 4 and Xbox One were both released in 2013. Both were enhancements over the previous generation's consoles, with additional computing power allowing some games to run at 60 frames per second at 1080p resolutions. Each unit underwent identical changes and repackaging in order to create high and low cost versions. The Kinect device was included in the Xbox One's initial launch and it proved highly controversial due to its potential privacy violations and a lack of developer support. And by the console's mid-generation refresh, the Kinect had been dropped and abandoned as a game device. Nintendo announced the Nintendo Switch in 2017, later in the 8th generation. The Switch is the first hybrid game console. It employs a unique CPU-slash-GPU combo that can operate at various clock frequencies depending on the application. It may be docked into a special docking unit that is connected to a television and a permanent power supply, enabling for higher resolutions and frame rates to be played, making it more comparable to a home console. It may either be removed and used as a handheld unit with the attached Joy-Con controllers, or it can be used as a tablet-like system with its touchscreen. The CPU and GPU work at reduced clock speeds in these models to save battery power, and the graphics aren't quite as good as they are in the docked version. The Nintendo Switch Online membership provided a bigger array of online services, including some free NES and SNES games, replacing the previous Virtual Console system. The Switch was created to remedy many of the hardware and marketing flaws that plagued the Wii U's launch and it has quickly become one of Nintendo's most popular systems following the Wii. In November 2020, both Microsoft and Sony launched successors to their respective home consoles. Both console families are designed for 4K and 8K resolution televisions with high frame rates, real-time ray tracing rendering, and the use of high-performance solid-state drives as internal high-speed memory to deliver game content much faster than reading from optical disks or standard hard drives, 
which can eliminate loading times and make open world games appear seamless. On November 10th, 2020, Microsoft launched the Xbox Series X and Series S, the fourth generation of the Xbox. The Series X is four times as powerful as the Xbox One X, with a base performance aim of 60 frames per second at 4K resolution. Backward compatibility with all Xbox One games, including those original Xbox and Xbox 360 titles that are backward compatible with the Xbox One, was one of Microsoft's aims with both units, allowing both series to support four generations of games. On November 12th, 2020, Sony released the PlayStation 5, which offers a similar performance gain over the PS4. The PS5 employs a proprietary SSD technology with input-output rates comparable to RAM chip speeds, resulting in substantially faster rendering and data streaming. The chip design is similar to that of the PlayStation 4, providing backwards compatibility with the majority of the PlayStation 4 library. To say the least, the last 60 years of gaming has been an adventure. It's difficult to imagine graphics and gameplay progressing much further than they are now. Unless anything drastic happens in the way we produce games, the first rise in graphical breakthroughs we've seen in over a decade will sadly flatten out. As the release of Unreal Engine 5 approaches, we may expect additional details in light, shadows, and overall levels of detail across the gaming industry. Creators will also be able to add additional levels of realism to a player's movements and interactions using other highly productive development tools. While these adjustments are minor, they represent an upgrade over previous games over the prior decade. As for the future of video games, you can tune into the channel's first ever podcast next week, where several guests and I discuss everything that is the future of video games. So be sure to check it out, you can find the link in the description. Either way, like and subscribe, and let us know what topics we should cover next. Maker, out.